Hey everyone, I'm Tom Hansen. Thank you again for joining us. This Christmas is already a tough one for much of the country, but things could get even worse for millions with key pandemic protections set to expire in the coming days. That is unless President Trump signs the latest relief bill into law. On Saturday, 12 million people are set to lose unemployment benefits established in the last round of COVID aid passed in March. Federal government funding will run out early next week, leading to a potential shutdown. And at the end of the month, eviction protections are set to expire, which could push millions out of their homes to start the new year. President Trump has neither signed nor vetoed the $900 billion bipartisan aid package passed by Congress. He is demanding the proposed stimulus checks be at least tripled in size. House Democrats tried to do just that Thursday morning through a process known as unanimous consent. It only took one Republican to sink the plan to increase direct payments to $2,000 per person. Speaker Nancy Pelosi plans to put the issue to a full vote next week. Despite aligning with President Trump on giving more money to the country, Democrats criticized him for refusing to sign the already passed bill into law. Was this bill perfect? No. But it was a down payment on getting COVID relief to the people of this country. And then the president, when we finally thought that we'd be able to give people hope, that's what people need, hope, and be able to begin to continue to work on this in January, doesn't give a damn about people. He threw more fear. He threw kerosene on a terror fire and is now threatening to veto this bill. CBS News White House correspondent Paula Reed joins me with more. She's in Florida with the president who is spending Christmas at his Mar-a-Lago resort. Paula, happy holidays. Good to see you. Uh, these negotiations have been going on for months now. Why did President Trump wait mm -hmm. until after the relief bill was passed to throw a wrench in the process? Well, it's unclear why the president waited this long. These, uh, these negotiations have been going on for well over six months. The president has remained largely on the sidelines. He has deferred to his Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin and his chief of staff Mick Mulvaney to negotiate on behalf of the White House. And the fact that he came in after there was a bipartisan consensus, after there was a bill, and then demanded that these payments be tripled, puts him not only at odds with his own party, but also puts millions of Americans in limbo as they wait for this relief. Yeah, it really surprised a lot of people and pretty much stunned everyone. Um, lawmakers from both parties are expected to override the president's veto of next year's military spending bill. So does President Trump think he has the leverage to push Senate Republicans into backing these $2,000 direct payments? That's right. So we're talking about two different bills here. Uh, the first uh, is, is a defense spending bill that the president had signaled that he would potentially veto if lawmakers did, did not bound his demand to include in there. Uh, curtailments for protections that are currently enjoyed by social media companies. Now, they have the votes to override this uh, this decision by the president to veto that bill. The president said he was also upset because in that bill were provisions that would require military bases named after Confederate leaders to be renamed. But that will likely uh, be an override that will still go forward. But when it comes to the stimulus bill, it's just it's not really clear what happens next. The president has not made it clear to anyone if he will veto this bill if it comes back uh, without these stimulus payments increased or if he'll just sign it, move along and then become involved in negotiations. Pretty much the only thing that lawmakers coming out of the session today really agreed on uh, is that they want the president to sign the bill as is. Paula, what if the president doesn't do anything and just lets the bill sit on his desk through the new year and through to potentially a new Congress. Those millions of Americans uh, remain in limbo, uh, waiting for that relief, either for their employer um, or those direct checks. Uh, the other problem you have is that the government will shut down on Monday uh, for the third time uh, in the president's administration. Now there is a potential stopgap measure uh, that they are considering to keep uh, the government going through the next session. But uh, there would certainly be consequences if the president just chilled, uh, decided uh, to do nothing. Yeah, it would certainly seem to be a mess. Um, in the meantime, President Trump is issuing another wave of pardons to his political allies mm -hmm. and extended family after granting clemency to targets of the Russia probe uh, and convicted war criminals uh, Tuesday. Tell us about the latest batch of pardons and what it tells us about how Mr. Trump is using his power on his way out of office. 
Well, the president has granted over 40 acts of clemency in just the past two days of pardons and commuted sentences. Some of the most notable, though, are two of his top advisors uh, who were both uh, convicted and or pleaded guilty. Uh, in the case of Paul Manafort, he was convicted in one case and pleaded guilty in another. Roger Stone was convicted. Both of those men received full pardons from President Trump. Uh, he also issued a pardon for Jared Kushner, his son-in-law and senior advisor's father, Charles. And back in 2005, Charles Kushner pleaded guilty guilty uh, to crimes related to tax fraud, uh, election fraud, and witness retaliation. Um, so in that case, uh, it was interesting, the prosecutor was one of the president's allies, Chris Christie. Chris Christie described that case as one of the most loathsome he had ever prosecuted, specifically referring to allegations that Charles Kushner, as part of that case, hired a prostitute to approach his brother-in-law filmed that encounter and then had it passed off uh, to his sister. But he has also been granted uh, a pardon now. The president's pardon power, though, is absolute. He can uh, offer a pardon or a commutation to whoever he wants uh, for federal crimes. It does not protect for, from state charges. But the, the choices so far that he's made, it really does signal that he is, is focused on people who have been loyal to him or people who have really high-profile connections. Yeah, and many people are anticipating even more controversial pardons uh, in the days and weeks to come while the president still has has his power. Paula, on CBSN Thursday, justice correspondent Jeff Pegues interviewed President Trump's former personal attorney, Michael Cohen, about what's going through his mind with this batch of pardons. Let's listen to what he had to say. What Donald Trump did by leaving, heading to Mar-a-Lago, and at the moment that he landed and was safe and secure, that's when they started to release the names for the pardon. He used to do the identical thing at the Trump Organization. Right before Christmas, when they would hand out Christmas bonuses, he would take off and leave. And once he was either in flight or he was already down at Mar-a-Lago is when they would release all of the bonus checks. And that way, if you were unhappy with what you got, you had no way to reach him because he wasn't picking up the phone. What he is right now is very, very nervous and he's very scared because in 27 days, he knows that Joe Biden is going to be sworn in, and that's when there's going to be a plethora of litigation and subpoenas that are going to be flying around that he cannot control anymore with his corrupt attorney generals as well as his corrupt people that are you know, standing beside him. Now, speaking of those investigations, what do we know about the, the investigations into the president uh, that could ramp up when he heads out the door? So there's a few different uh, matters that could continue uh, to be pursued. Uh, at the federal level, uh, congressional investigators, uh, they have done reports and unearthed uh, information and evidence uh, suggesting a wide variety of misdeeds uh, by people in the president's inner circle. There are still also questions uh, about the president's conduct surrounding the Mueller investigation, particularly some of these pardons. Some of the Mueller prosecutors uh, have suggested, uh, for example, bring Roger Stone, bring Paul Manafort, put them on the, put them on the stand, uh, see if, in fact, in fact, there was any quid pro quo, any agreement uh, for these pardons in exchange for them not cooperating in that investigation. So that is one possible track. But the, the bigger concern for the president is likely at the state level, particularly in the state of New York. Uh, the Manhattan District Attorney uh, has been investigating uh, the president for various business matters related to possible uh, allegations of fraud. That's a concern for the president because even if he was to, to test the boundaries of the pardon power, try to pardon himself, some of his associates, those pardons only extend to federal charges. That does not protect to you from anything at the state level, and that's got to be somewhat of a concern uh, for President Trump. Now, Michael Cohen, of course, uh, he, he was really very helpful in a lot of these investigations uh, in terms of unearthing or suggesting avenues for investigators to pursue, suggesting that the president uh, may have been dishonest on his taxes and or uh, with banks. And speaking of taxes, uh, there is still the outstanding issue of the president's tax returns and why we haven't seen those. Uh, those could potentially be used as evidence in some of these cases if they are brought into open court, those tax documents could potentially, possibly uh, be introduced into evidence. 2021 will be a very active year. Uh, Paula Reed with the president in Florida. Thank you so much and happy holidays.